everyone. So well, uh, we're getting towards the end of the show almost here, huh? A little bit. How was last week for you guys in terms of the material? Were you all right? Brain is a lot of terms, right? Yeah. So we're going to do some of that tonight in the dissections. Uh, and then the spinal cord and the special senses, it's not that many terms from the terminology perspective. Uh, how was the understanding part for you guys? You want to go through it a little bit? Well, it was a little easier than the brain. At least that's what I found. Yeah, the brain is definitely a big challenge in terms yeah. of you know all that. Um, you could see my spinal cord, right? Yeah. Yeah, the brain is just a lot of terms, and it's just hard to understand because it's um, it's uh, sort of all over the place. You know, it's like it's 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 not sort of linear like the heart. We can understand the heart that way much easier, I think. Um, um, as we and if questions come up with the brain, we can certainly talk more about it. And and you know, uh, also tonight in lab, if you want, or offline, I can meet with you as well if that's helpful. Um, as we get to the spinal cord, that was a pretty pretty long chapter. Um, I'm not mostly I'm interested in you guys understanding the spinal cord from a retention perspective in terms of terminology. We don't have that many um, terms that we use in terms of the lab. And a, a lot of this is basically anatomy, um, how the spinal cord works. And we have in the spinal cord, we have a lot of basically tracts that go up and down. Sensory go up from the from the body to the brain, and then the motor pathways go down from the brain or the spinal cord to the body and have an effect on the body. Um, but the spinal cord is sort of the place, um, yeah, where all that stuff travels through with these and 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 sensory um, pathways are also known as ascending. So they go up and and descending, going down is the is the motor output part. Um, so mostly we have these tracks, and then we also have a couple of uh, we have reflex centers in the in the spinal cord. So a lot of some some rudimentary integration happen can happen. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh oh. Um, but mostly the pathways that that higher integration is happening up in the brain, and so the core just brings the information up and down. We have these enlargements here, one in the neck and one in the lumbar spine, and those are where the spinal cord thickens a little bit, and that's because um, we have to accommodate the upper and the lower extremities there. So there's a lot more going on in that area versus the mid back or or the trunk kind of thing. So those are these enlargements and why we have those. Um, in terms of the terminology, and again, if you have a question, just butt in. Uh, if somebody reads the chat, just you know, help me out and um, interrupt me. Uh, but in terms of another few terms that we want to know is the spinal cord grows um, and ends around L1, L2 up up in here and then the rest is just spinal nerves and so when we look at that from an, from a growing perspective the nervous system doesn't grow as much as the muscles and the bone system and so the baby the spinal cord slowly goes up as the as the person grows taller um and so we have a few terms you have an area where the spinal cord comes to a tip at the end here around that l1 l2 area we call that the conus medullary so that's like a cone shaped thing and then after that, we have nerves just going down through the canal. And when you take the spinal cord out, it sort of looks like these nerves hanging down. And they call that the caudal equina. The horse's tail is what that means. And so that's a descriptive term. And that's just nerves going down and then feeding the lower part of the, of the body, um, spinal nerves. This is helpful because we can actually feed uh, medicine or, or get um, cerebrospinal fluid out of the spinal canal for analysis um, um, below the spinal cord here, L1, L2. And in this area, then we don't have to worry about tapping the spinal cord and injuring in it. Up here, you would have to be worried that you, you, you know, you're going to injure the spinal cord and we don't want to do that. So if you have somebody get an epidural or, or some kind of an injection, it's done below here uh, in the lumbar, lumbar spine. Low, low, low spine. 
All right, so that's good for that. We have nerve roots coming out on every on every. Um, take this off here. Uh, let me get to a cross section. And you look at the so that we looked at the spinal cord the lengthwise now, and now we can look at the spinal cord the cross section. Then we have a few more terms that we are interested in uh, there. The um, uh, the spinal cord, as you look at from a white matter, gray matter is opposite of the brain. The brain has sort of the cellular parts, the, the, the cell bodies on the, on the surface on top. Uh, 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 and then the pathways go down through the brain. And so the white matter is more on the inside and the gray matter on the outside, gray matter being cell bodies. On the spinal cord, it's the opposite. It's the inside is more where we have the cell bodies and the outside surrounding is more where we have the pathways. Um, and from uh, when we when we look at these, when they call these these gray matter. They call these the horns. There's um, um, where are my horns? <laughs> Maybe here. Huh? So uh, we have an, an anterior horn, we have a posterior horn, and we have a lateral horn. Here we go. And these are the, the, the parts of the gray matter. And the anterior horn, the front part, solely has um, um, uh, motor nuclei in it. So that's where all the pathways going up and down the spinal cord, or they're, they're the sensory and the, uh, and the motor pathways. They are very well organized in here. We don't have to worry about getting all the organizational structure memorized or anything. But when it comes then to the gray matter, we want to know that in the front portion, the anterior horn, we just carry motor stuff, motor nuclei. In the posterior horn, all we're going to have is sensory nuclei, sensory stuff. So from that perspective, all the information that goes into the spinal cord will come in through the back door, through the back portion into the posterior horn, and all the information going from the spinal cord to the body goes out the front, in the front portion, the motor side. And then the lateral horn is where we have autonomic nuclei. And so that autonomic, I think of automatic, automatic processes in the brain. These are the things we don't even have to think about. They just work automatically. They are all motor nuclei. The automatic system is a motor system that influences the body function uh, unconsciously. And so from there, when we have then these, uh, these horns, we have nerve roots that come out of the, go into the horn or come out of the horn, depending on the back of the front. Um, and those are simply the dorsal root are only sensory nerve fibers uh, or axons, of course, that is, and the and ventral roots, the front, the anterior portion, they also call that ventral and dorsal. The neurology, they they can't get it together that they all will call it posterior versus dorsal and anterior versus ventral. They still use old terminology. So this is where you have this dorsal coming in and this ventral root coming in. Um, and so the dorsal roots only have sensory, the ventral root only have motor fibers. And then as we connect them together, at that point, we call that the spinal nerve. And the spinal nerve is then what exits the spinal cord or the spinal column, I should say, the bony encasing. So when we look at this picture here, all in between the bones, all that comes out here, that's going to be a spinal nerve right in here. They're very vulnerable in that area. There's not that much protection. Um, but it's a pretty good system, actually. And then right after we exit the, the bony encasement, we have an, a shot off coming out and goes to the back portion of the body. And then a bigger portion goes to the front, the viscera, the anterior portion, as well as the limbs, the upper and lower limbs coming out of the front portion. So they call that then a rami, anterior and posterior rami. We don't need to know these terms from memory, but I want you to understand them. So the First portion coming right out of the court, they call that the root. Then we get to the spinal nerve. And then once we exit the bony encasement, it splits. And then they call that the rami. So each spinal nerve, though, is made up of thousands of neurons. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Each right. spinal nerve has 
you know, a, a gazillion new axons really in it. You know, despite the nerves, when we call something a nerve, like that that yellow cable, it's really axons at the end of the day. Yeah. At all the cable parts. Right. Uh, or also, I mean, actually, no, axons and dendrites. It's because if you look at here, what's interesting since we had that discussion, it's the next point here is this bulge here that we could see. And the sensory nerve coming in, this portion here technically is the, the dendrite, the, the thing coming in. And mm -hmm. then in this, in this dorsal root ganglion, that's what that bulge is called. That's where we have the cell body. And so afterwards, then technically we call it the axon uh, after the cell body whatever goes further inward into the system. And so the nerves themselves are really axons and dendrites, but generally we consider them being the long extensions. So we usually just say axons are in there. Okay. I have um, one more question. What yeah, is, yeah. Uh, you mentioned before, when they take a spinal fluid, what are they taking? Oh, they're taking the liquid out, a little bit of cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. And that's because the cerebral spinal fluid goes around the brain. Yeah. And on the inside of the brain, and then it goes around the spinal cord. Oh, and actually, there's a little small dot that I don't know where I have it on a picture, but in here, there is a little small hole in the right. middle of the central canal, and that also has spinal fluid going through it as well. And so they take the fluid themselves, but since it goes to the brain, around the brain and the spinal cord, they can analyze it and see is there meningitis in the brain or something like that you know, because the fluid goes all the way down. And also they can put in medication and epidural, for example, in childbirth, they do that a lot. So the, the structure of the spinal cord that you were just showing the cross section, that essentially ends at the conus medullaris? Yes. And then it's, is it just nerves that are extending beyond that, but they're still surround, they're still inside the back, spinal yeah. cord? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, if you if you if you look at this part here, we, we have we had this dura motor, the arachnoid motor, and the pia motor in the brain that we talked right. about. The okay. pia motor is straight on the structure itself, so that's a shiny film. Mm -hmm. And the arachnoid motor is further out, and then the dura motor is the outside bag. Now in the spinal cord, the arachnoid and the dura are very close together because you don't need that that amount of spidery sort of, you know, that that um, springy-like stuff like in the brain it needs to be much more pro pro protected, the brain. Um, but around the dura motor, which is basically a bag on the outside, and that PO motor is where we have the fluid. And that goes all the way around here. Got it. Okay. Um, it's interesting. The PO motor actually comes together here, and it, it goes down and anchors into the coccyx. And we don't have that term written down, but that's called the phylum terminale, if you ever see that. And if you see in a, in a, I, I was a lot, I able to do one dissection on a spinal cord and you can see it's very shiny and it's anchoring the cord to the bone on the bottom. So it doesn't just flip flop around. Wow, that's so cool. It's, yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. It's pretty intricate. Um, all right. So that's for mostly the cord that I think the dorsal root ganglion I talked about. And then when we get to these internal pathway structures, uh, I don't need you to memorize any of that. But the thing that's interesting is well, the word somatotopy. So that's the word for is orderly mapped out in the body. So this little small, and consider this cord is like your, your index finger size, or maybe even your pinky. It's tiny uh, uh, in terms of its diameter. But the red ones here are the motor pathways, the one that come from the brain down, and the blue ones are the one that go up. And if you look at the names, these most of these names are by destination. Cortico is the brain cortex, spinal is the spine. So you can see the word and go like, oh, that pathway goes from the brain to the spine. Or here, some of them don't work out. But look here, it goes spinal cerebellar. So you know it goes from the spine to the cerebellum or spinothalamic. If you further on in the analysis, we talked about the thalamus being sort of a rudimentary integration center. So once you know a little bit more integratively, then you know, oh, the spinothalamic tract is the one that brings the sensory touch and that kind of pain fibers from, from the body into, into the thalamus. And then from the thalamus to the cortex, we have another pathway. 
And so that's really the main thing on, on this slide because it gets very intricate and gets too crazy, I think, for our initial discussion here. The other thing that's interesting is when we look at generally the pathways, the sensory pathway is a three neuron pathway and the motor pathway is a two neuron pathway. So the sensory pathway goes, and it makes sense here because it goes from the receptor to the spinal cord and then it has a connection in the spinal cord and then it goes to the thalamus. That's where that thalamus comes in. And then the thalamus is where we have that second, they call it the second, second order neuron, goes to the third order neuron. And then that delivers the message to the cortex. And we can feel temperature, we can feel pain, we can interpret it too at that point then. So that's where we get into that then sensation versus perception discussion in the next chapter. The motor pathway basically has just two, has an upper motor neuron, that goes to the spinal cord level where the where the muscle area is, or you know, mostly that goes to muscles and glands. And then and then from there it goes to the effector. And again, most of the time that's a muscle. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting here is we can differentiate between a lesion, somebody has a problem in the upper motor neuron, or a problem in the no, mo, lower motor neuron. And you can see that here, where if the lower motor neuron is injured, at, we got what we call flaccid paralysis. That's not this one. That's just where we're limp. Because somewhere the nerve connection does not go to the muscle at all. If we have an upper motor neuron lesion, then the, the sort of paradox comes in a little bit. And the fact is that most of our muscle contractions are actually rhythmically always contracting. The brain tells it not to contract when it doesn't need to. So when you take that inhibition away and you break the upper motor neural lesion, you don't have those uh, messages say like, hey, don't contract this, you know, contract the other muscle. And you end up having all the muscle firing and the, the flexor muscles are more strong, more stronger than the extensor muscles. So you end up having the wrist go down and the, you know, upper arm, the, the, the bicep sort of pulls the forearm to the, up, to the shoulder. And if you just, you know, visualize and realize that, then you go like, holy cow, these are always contracting. This must hurt like hell if somebody has this problem going on. Um, but I, does that make sort of sense how that's going with this two neuron lesion thing or two neuron thing? No? Nobody? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the visual definitely helps to understand, you know, you, you can put the two and two together. It's, it's yeah. at least giving opening the idea like, oh, OK, I've seen somebody with that problem before, like, and it makes more sense now as to why that happens. Yeah, and that's all I wanted to take away is trying to start making some sense of this is, you know, this is electricity stuff here, this organization. So, I, you know, I don't want you, I want you to get the big picture on those things from a you know testing perspective the lab is is a few terms that we have on that list um okay so that's the two neurons there that's good enough for that what else do we have in this chapter well then we get the reflexes and the reflex arc is kind of like back to uh back to the negative feedback loop in some ways you you know or the basic function of the nerve you have a you have a, a receptor pick up something you you know here po poking me you got the nerve going into the spinal cord uh into the brain or the spinal cord depending on how how complicated the integration is and then the affair the efferent um, nerve, the motor nerve calls then basically to the effector and contracts the muscle or pulls it away. Or, or if you do the classic reflex hammer on the knee, yeah, I had a patient when he was in his fifties and he came in, that was like 15 years ago or so, but he, I did the reflex on him. He looked at me, go like, they really do that. I thought that was only on TV. <laughs> like, yeah, they do. And he was in his fifties already. So I was like, where did you pick all of that up or not? So anyway, that's the traditional reflex if when the doctor hits the front of the patella and your leg swings up. Basically, you're stretching the muscle a little bit because you're pushing on the on the tendon and you're stretching that. And then the, the reflex 
the muscle contracts because the muscle is afraid that the tendon gets pulled off the bone, so it engages. And so that's a classic reflex where you have information going in, a little integration, information going out. And um, so that's the classic one. We also have other ones. We have a cross flexor and cross extensor reflex. Let's say, for example, you're like, you're like falling down and you, you, your foot goes on to attack and you have to raise up that leg. You, you got to do something, otherwise you're going to fall you know, to the floor. So reflexively, the opposite leg will push down if one pushes up and you get the same in the arm. So that's an interesting reflex too. So we have these different ways the body responds. Oh, for example, we have the, the sneezing reflex, you know, where you slowly, 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 you, you get that itch in the nose and then you got to ultimately sneeze. That's where you can sort of see some reflexes have what we call summation. So a stimulus has to get to a, to a threshold and then it releases the reflex. We also have pathological reflexes. This is a very interesting one, the Babinski reflex. In a baby, if the baby gets stroked here on the toes like that, with a little you know reflex hammery or so, its toes will go out, up and out like this. It will spread out and will raise up a little bit. In a baby, that's normal. But once we start walking, you can't walk like that. If your heel strikes the floor and every time you do that, the toes will go up. You got to push the toes down and push them into the ground to be able to walk. And so in an adult, the reflex goes that when you strike them here or you know, after the child learns how to walk, the, the toes will point downward, not upward. If they still point upward, they call that a pathological reflex because it tells us something is wrong with the nervous system. Something is not integrated. Fairly rudimentary because it's a reflex. So that's kind of an interesting thing too that we have there. That's the reflexes. Any questions around that sort of brief mentioning of that? If not, we can go to the plexi. And we have a few nerve plexuses, plexi, and those are rearrangements of nerves. So we have the spinal nerve coming out of this, the cord right here, boom. And then that, let's say that nerve goes straight to the biceps muscle and it travels straight to the biceps muscle. And then we have a problem here and this level gets injured. Well, then all the nerve energy that goes to the biceps muscle is going to not work anymore. And so the biceps will go in. So instead of doing that, we say, oh, why don't we have the biceps get energy from four or five different levels and then we rearrange the nerves. And at the end, all the axons going to the biceps will go to the biceps, but they come from multiple different levels. Why is that positive? Well, if one area breaks a little bit, we still have energy coming from all the other levels. And so we still have function. So a lot of how that body stuff works, you know, is, is, is how can we keep the function going? And that's how evolution sort of figured us out, I think. So we got one in the neck. We got the brachial plexus is a very big plexus that feeds the arms. Um, and then we got a lumbar and a lumbar and the sacral. Sometimes they say the lumbar sacral um, goes together for the lower extremities. So that's briefly plexi. Again, you don't need to, I think you can use this as a reference when you go to a higher level class if you do. And then they probably make you start memorize a few more of these things. And that brought us to the cranial nerves. And again, I don't do too much on memorizing the cranial nerves because you got 12 of these cranial nerves and they got all different names and they all got different functions. Um, they're named by the Roman numerals, one, you know, that stuff. And then also they have a name. Most of the nerve, the, all these nerves feed the brain, feed the head and the face and the neck. Um, and so many, most of them are, um, are motor. No, they're both. But some of them are only exclusively sensory or motor. For example, you have the, the, the first one is the smelling nerve. So the one that goes right to the brain uh, above the nose. We'll see that today on the brain when we dissect it. That is no motor fibers in that. All that thing needs to do is smell. So that's all sensory. Uh, the vision is the same. The optic nerve is the same. So I kind of group them a little bit that way. And what I did in here is I sort of wrote down, it's a little crowded, but I wrote down what do each nerve do? Uh, uh, and so you have sort of a little bullet point way of, 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 
um, um, referencing that back because again, I'm not gonna make you study these nerves as a detail goes. Um, yeah, some of them are just motor and those are mostly the ones that move the eyeball around. So we talked about the eyeball in the next chapter. All right, so that's just a couple of pictures to visualize the uh, cranial nerves. And again, the, the, if you don't, the questions you are, you go ahead. No. Uh, and then we finish up this chapter be, with the autonomic nervous system. And again, from a testing perspective, I mostly want you to understand it. And the autonomic nervous system is also known as the vegetative and the visceral. That's just because it's involuntary, it's unconscious. Um, and, it, and it helps us, our body work, uh, function work in an optimal equilibrium, so to speak. So we've got these two extremes. You've got sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic is the end, end range of the danger nervous system, sort of like you fight it or you run away from it. So that's like you're thinking, you know, somebody's a bear in the corner is attacking you. What are you going to do about it? But also that nervous system is highly activated when we drive, for example, in a lot of our sort of nervousy or uh, uh, alert type uh, things. Um, and you see what they do. It's pretty self-explanatory in some ways and the effects. I, I've been going pretty well with myself thinking if I need to run away from the lion, what is my body going to do? Well, I want to make sure I have enough energy in the skeletal so uh, muscles so I can run. So the blood flow will increase. My I need more oxygen. So my, my respiratory rate goes up. My bronchi gets dilated. My heart goes up and, because, because I want to bring that oxygen to the tissue so I can run and don't get eaten. The pupils dilate so I can get as much information coming into the system and analyze what's going on um, and, and, you know, the dangers and so forth. Um, and then the, the liver starts actually making glu glycogen breakdown so he gets more glucose in the system. So we make sure we have enough energy. And then the hair stands up on the back of the neck. That's kind of like we still have that from the animal kingdom, like the cat wants to make sure it's fluffy and big appearing. So that's a little bit of that left over so that's a sympathetic fight or flight nervous system and again it's a little sort of a gray zone this is like the extreme and then we are uh, often a little bit in that framework and then on the other side we have the parasympathetic nervous system and that helps rebuild the body resources that's another way of looking at it one uses the body's resources to apply it and then one replenishes it and they should be balanced and we are a little bit out of whack in our modern lifestyle unfortunately so that's where we want to you know try to increase a walk or relaxing and so forth anyway that's pretty good for the ans they call that the ans and now we can go um and do the second chapter unless you have a question Because maybe we're not going to go over time too much today. Yeah, I have a question, Professor. For the um, visual ac acuity, I can't, what does that mean? Like, like two points, like on the chart. I don't get what that meant. Like from seeing one point to the other point. Wait, what? What are you talking about? Remember you gave us the assignment for the Snellen chart. Uh huh. I don't really understand what visual acuity means. Well, it means that the the, the eye can see two points versus one point. So if you have two points and they're really close together, the eye thinks it's one point. It doesn't think it's two points. And so oh, that's okay. the acuity. And so the, um, the sharper we can see, the closer these two points can be together and we can still make them out as two points, like two dots. And so that's, when the letters get smaller and smaller, the eye can differentiate that um, depending on the acuity, the sharpness of the vision. Acuity, oh, okay. the sharpness of the vision. Yeah, th think, of, think of the letter E. And if it's really tiny, it just looks like one blurred dot. Um, but as it gets larger, you can start to differentiate the different lines. And so that's sort of the different points. So when it's blurry and you can't, see that it's actually an E, that's that's when uh, 
you sort of know you're at the limit of your eyesight in terms of sharpness. Okay, all right, thank you guys. Yeah, and it's just, you know, a little screening thing to understand, sort of start understanding that eye stuff. But it's actually not a bad one to once in a while do, uh, you know, and then you see if it's really crappy, then you can go to the ophthalmologist. Um, as, as we get to talking about the sensory system, the eyes, the ears, the touch, and all of that, we have a few things to point out. The one is sensation is the awareness of a change and perception is the interpretation of it. What does it mean? Do you, you, know, you see a face here or do you see a person uh, um, um, playing the flute? And so the perception is, is not the same as sensation. Um, so that's important to differentiate those two. Then we have a lot of, um, I guess, simple receptors. Those are like the, the temperature, the, um, the, 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 the touch, the pain. Um, those are like pain, for example, just free nerve endings. And when we cut something, then that sends off a signal. The touch is just an onion layer thing that squeezes when we squeeze, they, those those layers come together. Those are cell membrane ultimately, and then when they touch, that sends up a signal. Uh, but then we also have complex ones, and those are the ones that we really kind of want to talk about it a little bit more in detail. That's the hearing, that's the vision, that's the smell and the taste. Those are the special sort of senses, and we'll go mostly into those. The other thing that's interesting: some senses adapt. Like, for example, the warm, the temperature, you can have put your hand in a cold water and then and then you or hot and cold and then lukewarm. The one where in the cold, it feels like this is cool. The one I mean, in the hot, cool and the other way around in the cold. And so that tells you that some of these receptors, uh, things are adapting, meaning we get used to it. And temperature is one of those. We have other ones that do not adapt. And we don't want them to adapt, like pain. We don't want the pain. I mean, we wish it were adapting, but pain means, means danger. And so if you twist your ankle and all of a sudden you don't feel anymore that you twisted your ankle, you're going to walk on that ankle and destroy it because the body can't adjust and see what is it, is it causing harm or, or, or damage. And so those are not adaptable. The other, the other one that's not adaptable is proprioception. And propria means one's own. And so this is proprioception is when we monitor our own body movement. And so that that's where you can close your eyes and you can still touch your nose with the fingers. Like, how the heck does that work? Because we got proprioceptors a lot in the joints and a lot in the muscles that do that, um, help, help with that. What's interesting is, uh, this is something I always want to teach is, is, is um, when you have a pain going into the brain, and you overlay it with a proprioception going into the brain, the pain fibers, the pain stimulus diminishes often. And so that's often when, like you walk, you walk, you walk, the kid walks into the wall and you start rubbing its forehead because you take it's this process where you've increased the proprioception because rubbing its skin, that's increasing proprioception. Um, um, and that decreases the pain stimulus. So you can't really feel it the same way. The same is true for many of us with chronic pain stuff like back pain or so. Movement is usually helpful um, with those things. And so what, what neurologically happens is the pain gate is called closes. It's called the gate theory. The pain gate is closing the more we increase the proprioception. And so that's kind of interesting to understand that concept. That was outside of the anatomy class. When I tell an other anatomy people, they're like, we don't know that one. <laughs> that's one from the clinical setting. The other thing that's interesting is you have to, not every part of the, of the body has the same amount of receptors that go to it. So the back, for example, doesn't have that many touch receptors compared to the to the thumb or the hand, and so you can take two points and measure how far apart do these two points need to be that the body recognizes them as two points versus as one point. And so if you can bring them very close together and you can have them be seen as two points or felt as two points, you have a, a small what they call receptive field of these receptors. If you put two points together and the body says, oh, I'll, you, you're touching just one thing, not two things, 
then that's the same nerve that gets irritated and that will be a larger receptive field. So that's um, um, just another way of how this whole thing a little works. It's, I use that clinically in the back. I massage back people often with my fingers more spread out because they can't feel in between. So they feel like you're touching a bigger touch for, for that versus in a hand or in a forearm, you, you want to work differently. Anyway, so that brings us then to the vision. And when we look at the vision, we're looking at that. So that's an interesting sense. Uh, and we, 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 we got to bring in light uh, into this eyeball. And we're going to have to figure out how to change that light coming in into a nerve impulse. So that's kind of what we're trying to do in there. And that's not that easy. So for once, um, we have muscles that pull the eyeball around so we can actually see wherever we want to, you know, whatever we want to illuminate. Um, <clears throat> when we look at the physical structure, we have we have a few layers to the eyeball. It's a globe-shaped thing. We have an outside one that's known as the fibrous tunic. That's usually fibers are on the outside. They make it tough to anchor things into the surrounding structures. They hold everything together kind of thing in the eye. That's the back is the white of the eye and the, that's the sclera. And in the front, it's the, 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 the see-through, the cornea. And then underneath that, we have what's known as the vascular tunic. Um, that brings the, uh, brings the blood into into the eyeball usually the outside shell brings blood in to something but it doesn't have um vessels inside the same way because usually vessels when they get very small they're very delicate and and if something is you know fibers and tough and holding it together that is not the same kind of environment you could think the same as like in a cartilage in the in a knee, for example a cartilage never has blood vessels in it because they would always break every time you take a step and so sort of conceptually, it's a similar thing that way. The vascular tunic is has, um, in the front, it has the choroid, and posteriorly it gets a, 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 a pigmented connective tissue. We'll see that today in lab. It's like looks black in there. Um, and that takes, picks up a lot of the light um, rays because the light comes into the eyeball and scatters all around it on the inside of the eyeball. And it's got to make sure we don't have too much scatter light because you know, then we can't see clear. Um, and then the retina is the other interesting part. That's the deepest layer. And that's the layer that picks up um, the light and transfers it into electricity. And it does that really, really interestingly. It changes a molecule. A single chemical molecule is changed. And if that molecule is changed, we fire an impulse or we fire to the next nerve and then the next nerve and then the next nerve and then the impulse goes up. You see here, when you look at the, at the, at the, when you look at the, here in the back in the internal tunic, the retina, you see you got these different, these different um, uh, looking cells and they are either rods or they are cones. And when you think about it, you have night vision, or you have day vision. And where are the rods and the cones here? And you have different levels of sensitivity. So the rods pick up dark vision. So if you're outside in the dark at night, you can see a little bit. And that's basically rods picking up um, that little bit of light that's around and then changing, you know, then the molecule here changes to root ops and changes to ops. And, and so we, 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 we send an impulse down that way. The cones are the ones that are color vision. And so when you, when the, the, it's light outside, the rods are way too sensitive. They all get what we call bleached out. So that's when you go from a dark room to a light room and it gets all bright. That's when you're activating all the rods at the same time and it's just too much. Uh, uh, and so we have to get used to it and they call that bleaching out the rods. And at that point then in the daylight, the cones will pick up all the light and not the rods. The rods are not happening. And of course, if it's too dark, there's not enough light for the cones to do anything, so they don't have to be bleached out. They're just not functioning at that point. So that's kind of cool. We got these muscles that 
pull the eyeball around that we can um, then, you know, focus in the center of the visual field. We got four muscles that are called recti muscles and they pull the eyeball either up, down, sideways, depending on where it's pulling from. And then we got two other ones and they pull the eyeball up and down. I mean, up and out or or down and out. The superior oblique, and I just memorized that one. A superior oblique is an interesting muscle that comes above, immediately from above and goes into through a pulley and then anchors into the eyeball on top here. And that one pulls the eyeball down and out. So I always just remember that the one on top pulls it down and out. The one on the bottom pulls it up and out. The one on the bottom is coming, the inferior oblique is coming from here down. We can see that tonight in the lab. We got these big eyeballs that we can see. Good, good, good. A couple more things on the eyeball that I think is important. The front of the eyeball here, this area, has the aqueous humor. That's sort of a liquidy, um, watery substance that nurtures, um, that nurtures and maintains the internal ocular pressure. We got to have this fluid pushing from the inside out. And then in the back, we have what's known as the vitreous humor or body, and that's a gel-like structure. And we can feel that today too. When we open the eyeball, the back is sort of jelly-like and the front is more viscousy. It just, oh, no, the front is more watery. Um, the back is more viscousy and that keeps the inside uh, eyeball nice and pushed out and so it doesn't collapse. The thing here that can happen is we can get uh, we can get clocks going on and we can in, the internal ocular pressure can change. So that's glaucoma is important with that. So that uh, needs to be monitored for that purpose. Okay, I think that's almost it for that. We have a couple more terms here. The optic disc is the area where the nerve comes out. So the optic disc is an area where you can see, if you look into the eyeball, you can see all the blood vessels coming in and out of here, and it's a little lighter. That's where the nerve and, of course, the blood vessels, too, go in and out of the eyeball. So you are not going to be able to have any visual things there. You don't have going to have any nerve, uh, any cones or any rods in there. So that's the blind spot. You're not going to see anything there. And then on the other hand, you got this area here known as the macula luta. It's also a little lighter. And in the center, it darkens again a little. And that's the fovea centralis. And that's the center vision. So in that area of the vision, you have, you have a direct pathway straight to mostly cones um, going on. And the other thing that's a little paradoxical in the eyeball is the light comes from here inward into the retina and then and then the, the 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 rods and cones pick up the light energy and transfer it into electricity and then pass on the neural you know uh, uh message on to the next couple of neurons two or three of them and then from there they leave they leave the through the optic nerve into the brain they leave the eyeball but the funny thing is the light needs to go through these cells before it can hit the rods and the cones, which is not efficient if you think about it. It's got to first go through thick stuff um, uh, before it can do its work. And so what we have happening in the fovea centralis, all these other cells are pushed to the side. And so all you have in here are cones mostly, a few rods too, but mostly only cones in there. So you have really acute vision in that area. Good. That's pretty good as far as I'm concerned. Any questions to that? So then let's spend a little few minutes on the hearing apparatus um, and the balancing. The thing, that's pretty cool stuff. The way, what I like more, I mean, what is always fascinating me is the vision is how the heck are we actually transferring the light into an electricity thing? That's just always fascinating. And in the ear, the hearing, it's very, it's also fairly fascinating. So when we look at the ear, we got um, the sound waves coming into the ear canal here, vibrate the eardrum, the tympanic membrane, oscillate or vibrate a few of these bones. We got three of these small little bones. And then that goes straight onto a membrane, 
right in here onto a membrane and then that vibrates too. It pushes fluid through, and this here is stretched out. It's this cochlea stretched out here. And so, because- then, I have a question when you have a chance. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is Quintasha. Yes. I'm curious if part of the ear, which parts of the ear is connected to causing deafness? Could you point that out? Yes, we'll get to that. There's a couple of possibilities for that. Um, make sure I don't miss it at the end. Let me finish the explanation of how it works real quick. So we have the, the, the fluid gets vibrated and we have here, we see they have, we have a couple of chambers. If you take this cochlea and stretch it out, you see there is two chambers that are connected with a fluid. And then there's a center chamber. And they call those the scala. They call one the scala of vestibuli, scala of tympani, um, are these different names. Again, we're not going to be worried about the details of the names. But then you have this inside channel here. And the inside channel looks like this. Big, big blown up looks like that. And so it's got these cells, they call them hair cells that go, that are anchored in a basement membrane or basilar membrane here. And then on top, you've got a membrane that lays on it. So it's sort of a gel type structure. Again, this stuff is very small. And, and, and we studied the brain. This is all happening in the petrous portion of the temporal bone. So it's very small stuff. But what's so cool about it is when, when we vibrate this liquid in here, at some point, the sound waves, which are waves that go up and down, I have a better picture for that. The sound waves will at some point bang against the walls and cross over from the top one to the bottom one of those fluid filled um, um, channels and they vibrate the middle channel. And so they end up vibrating this thing here and these air cells bend and when they bend, they fire a nerve impulse. And so that's how the hearing works. So they fire a nerve impulse and then we can hear. And we're along the path of this cochlea that, um, that is physically as a structure, we can have a different pitch. So the lower pitch is closer to the um to the wait 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 i forgot which one because an arrowing of the bony labyrinths towards the helicotroma low pitch sounds hair still closer to the apex while high pitch sounds excites closer to the base because it has a matter of like how physically long large that sound wave is is very crosses over into that central canal and when you look at hearing and not being able to hear we can have a couple of things. We can either have the nerve not work right. So this, this whole system is not working right. Or we can have a problem in the conduction. So the stuff doesn't, the sound waves doesn't, don't reach uh, the, 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 the cochlea where all that neurology stuff happens. And so when we actually test people, we can do a very simple test where we can have a tuning fork in space and we can tell the person can see can they actually hear when the sound waves go through um space through air and then we can put the we can put the um we can wait where is that that's the that's the rhine actually test and then the weber test is we put the fork we vibrate and put it on the bone and then the vibration of the bone also gives us um and the ability to hear um, because it conducts sound waves as well. And if we can hear with the conduction going through the bone, but we cannot hear with the conduction going through the air, then we know we have some more problem between the ear and the sound waves going to the cochlea. We call that a conduction deafness or conduction uh, decrease in hearing. That could be because our, our bones have, osteos, have, have uh, uh, arthritis in them our little small ear bones, because I don't know, we listen to Def Leppard all life long or something, you know, too loud of music or something, and we just used it up. Um, but I think generally, if we have a, 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 a hearing deafness that also is congenital, for the most part, we're looking at the neurosensory um, deficit at that point. And so that happens in this area here where we make sound, from sound waves to the nerves. And further than that, from where 
you know, the differences between uh, where along the pathway it happens, I don't know that level of detail. Does that help a little bit, Kitosha? No? Yes, yes. Okay. This is a start. We could do more research too if you're interested. I'm happy to read up on it too. So that's the hearing. So that's kind of pretty neat, I think, how the sound waves create vibration that bends hair cells and then we can hear. And a similar is true for the equilibrium because we also have the equilibrium um, system inside that area there. Instead of going to the cochlea now here where we were hearing, we have these three rings that go in a different direction, these semicircular canals. And at the bottom, we have what's known as the otricle and the saccule, which are um, um, just different areas. And so when we look at the, <clears throat> the bottom portions, one of them is horizontal, the other one is um, what vertical, and they code for um, acceleration, deceleration movements in both directions. So if you are in an elevator and goes up really fast, you're going to have to saccule. The saccule move give you the idea that you're accelerating and then decelerating because you got hair cells again, and then you got a membrane again on top. And when and when and when the elevator, let's say, goes up really fast, that gel structure lays rests behind a little bit. It takes a little moment to catch up with the speed, and that bends the hair cells, and that tells us, oh, we're de we're accelerating, or then when it's the other way around, we're decelerating. Same with two. You go into a fast car, you're gonna have this one happening on the on the horizontal side. So that's pretty uh, interesting. So it's basically. Um, 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 the gel staying behind a little bit and having to catch up, and that sends the signal into the brain. The semicircular canal are angular rotational movements that happens. This is interesting because you can see when you turn around in circles, you first you're getting dizzy, and at some point you don't get dizzy anymore until you stop, and then you're dizzy. What happens there is, this is the one. What happens there is. Is, is in those canals, the gel looks like this and the hair cells look like that and then there's the channel. But when you start turning, then the gel falls behind a little bit until it catches up. And then you can keep turning in the same speed and the gel the gel's back here. So the nerves aren't firing anymore and you're just thinking everything is fine until you stop. And then it's the dizzy and you can't stand up and you fall down, you know, and the kids have fun with that. Uh, a little bit, but that's basically where you can feel how that gel structure falls behind a little bit and then catches up. And so that's another one that I think is pretty darn cool, how hair bending of hair cells sends signals out. And then lastly, we have <clears throat> the taste. Uh, what's interesting about there is the taste. We have sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Most other things are smell. 80% of what we eat, we smell. So that's interesting. The, the, the taste are chemicals in liquid. The smell are, uh, uh, well, they actually also also have a little bound um, with, with some, they have to have a little liquidy on them, I think, um, as smelling as well. But what happens then, they, they, they connect with receptors and those are again, hair cells and the receptors are on the hair cells and then they pick up the different smells. And so you got a gazillion different, you know, receptors up for smelling. For taste, we just have those five. All right. And that's it. That was P.D. Gonzalez. Any questions of that? No, good. Otherwise, put in. I'm going to keep working. So we'll finish up on time. Yeah, we're good. Good. And then, huh? Oh, Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Phyllis is saying, yeah, we're good. Okay. And then the last thing we really want to do is this week and so this week i i want you guys to start doing what are we pathology presentations right so i have that the seventh is where we want some video stuff up so i want you guys to reach out to me if you need help with that more help i haven't seen too many come back um from the presentation and generally i've given i've given I do zero or full point value. So I want to make sure people are actually 
you know, changing things around a little bit. If I give like two points off here and two points there, a lot of students will just not worry about making the corrections. So go back to that pathology presentation. Um, um, if you need help, you know, fixing it up and then starting making the video, uh, I will go with Zoom, but I can also help you guys through Screencast-O-Matic or some YouTube way of doing it uh, if you want. Um, but work on that and reach out to me if you have questions or problems. Otherwise, I'm assuming everything is rosy. And maybe it's not. I don't know. Um, but then the rest of this week, we're leaving the brain now. Now we're getting into the lungs and the digestive system. So it's, um, it's again, much more linear uh, in terms of the, the, what, what's happening with the lungs and the digestive system. At least I think the brain is just very complicated. And so we got a little bit of coloring and labeling, not too fancy. We got a little discussion about have to get anything out of the gratitude. And then this week, I actually, we got to make this the 14th. We're going to make this the two week because some people start late and I still keep forgetting that. But this week, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do a food journaling for five days. As we talk about the digestive system, um, I want, and again, if this is too triggery for you, then don't, don't worry about it Then talk to me. Okay. I don't need people who have anxieties around food issues. If that's a lot of us have those, but when, when we look at the journaling versus a diary, uh, I'm more interested in, yeah, what did you eat? Uh, how much did you eat? But also like what time where were you in the car? Were you with somebody? Were you talking? What were you doing? How was your mood? because that's very, very crucial as if food stuff comes together. And I got this activity from actually from teenager websites uh, because um, to help them get good food choices going. Well, especially teenagers eat so much snack. So we got to transition them a little bit um, to more real food, so to speak. Um, but I want you to focus more on the journaling portion, uh, not, not, you know, if you're not fully accurate with how much exactly, I'm not too worried about that, but I want you to get an idea, you know, uh, of like your own food behaviors a little bit. And again, if something is too triggery, then don't, then don't reach out to me and we can figure out what else you can do um, for that. But it's kind of an interesting one. It seems like people have, you guys seem to have uh, found it interesting to do the sodium, huh? I read a lot of positive feedback on that. Like, it's one of those things we never really do. And then when we do it, a little builds awareness. And so that's the same with the food. You know, if you're always eating the food in the car and you're always stressed out and bored, maybe after a week we can look at that and go like, hmm, maybe we'll change a little bit. So I'm more interested in that than I'm not going to look at what you eat. That's all up to you guys. That's not you know, my judgment. Call. Anywho, how are you guys doing? Is that pretty clear? Yeah, professional.